Hi, you're watching DNA Today, a multi-award winning genetics podcast where we explore everything to do with genetics from CRISPR to rare diseases to new research. We have won the Science in Medicine podcast award for many years now. We have hundreds of episodes and we really hope you enjoy these conversations where we dive into so many genetic concepts. I'm Kira Deneen, a certified genetic counselor and your host. In this episode, I'm joined by two genetic counselors to explore the experience of being a male in our field. Danielle Verconda is a certified genetic counselor and associate professor at Baylor College of Medicine in Houston, Texas. Dan joined the genetic counseling field in the late 80s and since then has been active in the field, contributing to professional societies, graduate level programs, and patient care. Really just hit the tip of the iceberg. I mean, we could go on and on about everything that Dan has contributed to the field. John Zimmerman is a certified genetic counselor as well. He's at UT Southwestern Medical Center in the Cancer Genetics Program. He's taken on the additional role of Director of Fieldwork for the UT Southwestern Genetic Counseling Program. And he's also the current president of the Texas Society of Genetic Counselors. So Dan and John, thank you so much for coming on and talking about a topic that I can't exactly relate to. So I really <laughs> appreciate you guys bringing on your own experiences here. Of course, thank you for the invitation. So as I said, we're going to be talking about, you know, being a male genetic counselor and just kind of the experiences around that. So I kind of thought we could kick it off with just what initially attracted you guys to the field of genetic counseling and how has your experience been just in general as we start our conversation of navigating a profession that is predominantly female? And obviously, as we start this conversation, I do want to mention and i'm sure everybody listening is thinking the same thing that you know gender is a spectrum majority of people will identify as male or female but they're also i just want to acknowledge that people that identify as non-binary or other places on the gender spectrum um but i identify as female um just you know for the purposes of this conversation that might be helpful to know um but anyway so dan maybe we could start with you of like what drew you to genetic counseling like I mean, maybe how you heard about it might be a little bit different than me and John. I don't know. Sure. Um, in high school, I as and as an undergraduate, I found myself drawn to genetics, biology, and psychology. And as an undergraduate, I wound up choosing biochemistry as my undergraduate major. But I struggled to identify how I might merge those interests into a career that would be a fulfilling career for me. Um, and it wasn't until my senior year um, as an undergraduate that my microbiology professor directed me to the college's career development center. Um, and that's when they were bricks and mortar, um, you know, not something virtual. Right. Um, and I came across a pamphlet on genetic counseling from Sarah Lawrence College. And I had never heard of it before. And as I read through that pamphlet, something clicked. And it was like a light bulb went off. And I was like, oh, my. I, I, I need to explore this further. And um, um, there's a lot more to the story after that, but that kind of gives you a sense as to how I stumbled across genetic counseling. Yeah, and that's surprising that that Career Center had that information. <laughs> like, I have to say, even nowadays, I'm surprised when Career Center is like happily surprised when they have genetic counseling on their radar and are sharing that with people. But um, good for the marketing director, whoever was the one that <laughs> did that for Sarah Lawrence. Um, you know, um, at that time so that you were aware of it. I mean, we were just chatting before the show that, you know, you grew up in New York, so this, it wasn't, Sarah Lawrence wasn't super far away for you. Um, yeah. But yeah, I mean, kind of serendipitous that you found that at that time and it led to this whole career. How about you, John? How did you initially say, okay, I want to explore this career in genetics and end up going to grad school and, and now being an active member in the field? Yeah, I actually did not know about uh, the profession of genetic counseling during my undergraduate career it kind of found me after, um, you know, I was bio pre-med and undergrad and, you know, left kind of disenchanted with the idea of medical school, not really sure what I wanted to do kind of with, with some of my, my interests and um, ended up just actually on our career website, there was a, a posting for a, a genetic counseling assistant position in a, a PGT lab. I thought, you know, maybe I'll check it out and, and, you know, as I kind of got into it, it really just just clicked, and I had the opportunity to work closely with a team of genetic counselors, and you know, um, not only supporting them but also shadow observe, and they were super super encouraging. Um, and I think having that support too of them, you know, for me feeling like it could click, but also them saying, you know what, this this makes a lot of sense, and then kind of supporting me in that journey of getting to to grad school from there. 
Yeah. So I was expecting opposite answers. So that's interesting that you found out about it later, you know, than, than Dan did. And I mean, that must have been a cool experience, especially being like in the fertility space of being a genetic counseling assistant. Like, um, I definitely would have loved that job prior and maybe in the future I will go into fertility. So we'll see. <laughs> um, but yeah, so I, I wanted to kind of see what your unique perspectives were in terms of what male genetic counselors really bring into the field and, and how it can benefit patients and just overall the pers- profession of what your gut reactions are as we kind of get further into this conversation. Maybe we'll reverse it. We could start with you, John. Yeah, um, I just as part of the field, I, I feel really welcomed and inclusive. Um, you know, as a male genetic counselor, I don't kind of feel othered and I I don't think it's created any sort of professional barriers for me or or kind of inhibited sort of my sense of belonging or community um, where I think it's maybe afforded me some benefits. I, you know, work in the the cancer space and, um, you know, it's we a big underrepresentation of of male patients um, in in cancer and and just in the medical field in general, you know, that and don't often, you know, seek the medical care as frequently as maybe they should. Um, But I think it's it's maybe kind of helped create some affinity with some of the the male patients I do see, um, you know, kind of recognizing that, you know, hey, there, this is, you know, not something where maybe a lot of your friends are seeing folks in genetics, maybe they don't, are not seeing a doctor and kind of being able to, you know, kind of build that, that commonality and say, kind of, I recognize you, I see you and, and use that as a way to kind of build relationships um, with, with some of my male patients. Yeah, that is a great point. Dan, anything to add on to like your own perspective? Um, you don't hate me for saying this, but there's a, a phrase that we're all familiar with. Men are from Mars and women are from Venus is sort of a stereotype, but there are some aspects to gender identity um, that may lend themselves to greater acceptance by some of our patients and some of our providers. And some of that may be based on bias, misconception, um, and, you know, microaggressions and other things that may take place when you are female versus male. Um, and also cultural and racial racial issues as well come into that uh, domain. Um, but some patients may attribute um, certain positive characteristics to my gender as being a male, um, and that can be a good thing or a bad thing. Um, and ultimately, I found my classmates were very accepting when I was in school. Um, I was sort of the unicorn in the class with um, 20 other students, me being the only one that happened to have a Y chromosome, at least that we know of. Um, I knew that joke was going to come up somewhere. Yeah. Seven minutes in, Sorry. there we go. <laughs> okay, uh, you called me out on it. Um, but I was going to make it if you didn't, so you can do <laughs> okay. it. <laughs> uh, yeah, but that, that at least uh, gives you some sense of um, my perception um, of, of how my gender has not impaired my ability to do some of the things I've been able to do. But I also recognize there are certain things that my gender may not allow me to do within the profession. Yeah, I think that's uh, well said and that there can be some challenges. I, you know, I'm thinking like you bringing up, you know, that you went to Sarah Lawrence and and that a lot of people in your class or everybody except for yourself was female. Um, John, did you have a similar experience in your class? Like, I think for people that have graduated in the last few years, there have been more males in genetic counseling. So like in my class of 30, we had two people that were identified as male. Um, But yeah, I don't know if you were similar, John. Yeah, we, um, I had one um, male identifying classmate um, and then there were two in the class before me. So was not alone um, and had a a good amount of um, male instructors um, and um, supervisors as well. So nice to kind of have that representation. Yeah, definitely. I think we've seen that kind of shift. Would you agree with that, Dan, that over the years, the percentage of genetic counselors that identify as male has increased? I should have pulled some statistics for this episode, but. Well, the the numbers have not changed all that dramatically. Um, uh, One of the differences now, when I was um, fresh out of graduate school, um, I pretty much knew most, if not all, of the male genetic counselors. Now that there are a higher number, even if the percentages have not changed as much as we might like to have seen, um, I don't know all of the male genetic counselors. And that's a good thing on the one hand, because there are more of us, um, but it's also not quite as intimate as it had been at them at sometimes in the past. Yeah, yeah, definitely. That makes sense. Now we're past 5,000 
genetic counselors in the U.S. and Canada combined. So that, you know, back in the 80s, we had a much smaller number. So it made sense that you can kind of, you're at the National Society of Genetic Counselor Annual Conference and other things that you're like, oh, we're seeing each other again and connecting that, you know, our field has just gotten bigger, which is a really good thing. We're able to help more patients in that area. Are there any experiences that you guys can think of or certain interactions where you felt like being a male positively impacted like that patient experience or like the perception of genetic counseling? I know, John, you talked about that a little bit just in terms of being in the cancer space of, you know, especially if you have a male patient of, you know, being able to have that commonality together. Are there any types of interactions that you think of a little bit more specific? Um, I, I think what comes to mind is, is uh, seeing male patients with um, their either female partners or female support people. And, and you know, I think, um, you know, oftentimes you, you can kind of have it just in jest, but about, you know, oh, they, you know, they never see the doctor. They never see, the, you know, they're not interested in seeking care. They're not interested in anything medicine um, and, and kind of being able to have a little bit of, I guess, allyship with them and, you know, saying like, I, you know, I know they're kind of, you know, maybe sending some of these stereotypes in your way, you know, perhaps just lightly and, and not with any malintent, but I can kind of then, you know, stand up and say, I, I, they, I understand, I would know this is a real thing and, and I'm glad you're here today and, and uh, kind of trying to offer that, that support whenever I can. Yeah, that's interesting just to be able to add more to the narrative if something comes up that is a stereotype where you can say, well, you know, looking at, you know, our gender, something where you can, you know, have that aspect in common with someone to be bringing that up. Um, anything come to mind for you, Dan? Well, I think as John mentioned, you know, sometimes it makes it a little bit easier for the male in a relationship or the partner in the relationship, perhaps to um, share or engage. Um, I don't know that that's necessarily the case in every session, certainly it's not, but I've certainly been in instances where I think my gender and my identity has facilitated greater engagement. Um, you know, th that to me would be one um, situation where it can be um, and has been helpful. Yeah, and, and I think adding on to this, that one dynamic that I've, I've seen in different clinics and just hearing from friends that are also in the field that are, that are male, looking at those dynamics of, let's say you're in a pediatric ses uh, setting and the geneticist is female and uh, you have a male genetic counselor, of having that interaction where the patients are assuming that the geneticist is the male and kind of looking at, oh, this person is going to be higher up in the, in the hierarchy of who the you know leading healthcare provider is, who has you know the higher degree of you know as genetic counselors, we have master's degrees, and geneticists are going to have a medical degree. Are there situations like that that you guys experienced either like you know in grad school when you're going through different rotations, or now like in your like actual professional career part, or anything similar to that? Well, the very example that you cited is one that I've encountered on multiple occasions where. Even if there isn't another person in the room, because of my gender, they, there are instances where um, I've been called doctor and I make it a point to ensure that I don't misrepresent myself to them. And, and I pretty much have a, a standard response that says, no need to call me doctor, call me Dan. I have my master's um, and you know that sometimes lightens the load. Sometimes they will apologize and I say, no, no, no need to apologize. I just wanted to make sure I don't misrepresent myself and whether that be because I am the only person in the room or there are other individuals who are not male in the room um, I still feel as it can be done tactfully without trying to make them feel uncomfortable or embarrassed but also recognizing that um, some of those stereotypes are appropriate to address and there are other instances where you might say you know what it's going to distract from the rapport building and maybe we just let it pass, but most of the time I will want to make sure that I'm not misrepresenting myself. Yeah, I agree with that. I've, I've probably had it less often in my career than you have, 
but there's been a few times where someone says to me, oh, Dr. Janine, and I'm like, oh, actually, that's, you know, my uncle. Like, I have my master, you know, so <laughs> referencing, you know, technically my dad's cousin if uh, family's listening. But, um, you know, to have kind of, like like you said, Dan, kind of have a, a witty, you know, response to it that kind of is a joke, but, you know, that does make it clear that, you know, it's like, okay, I'm not a doctor, you know. Um, sometimes I'll get a fax, Dr. Janine. I'm like, oh, that's, that's, that looks nice, <laughs> you know, but not, not the case. Um, how about you, John? Yeah, kind of building off that, you, you know, also kind of have an opportunity there to have patients maybe con confront some of their own implicit biases, but hopefully in a safe space too, right? Where they, they don't feel again, you know, judged or called out, but they can say, oh, you know, I, I came in with this expectation and this is not how it is. And I can see now, uh, you know, kind of the error of that and, and it can be like a, a, a safe kind of learning experience for them in that way. Yeah, yeah, of just being able to explore that and as you said, like creating that safe space where you can have these conversations, because as genetic counselors, we are having very complex conversations where we want people to feel comfortable to ask questions that they may be hesitant to because they feel like, oh, this is a simple question. Maybe I should already know this or did you already cover this? And, you know, we're already creating an environment for that. We can include other topics as well and other dynamics there. When thinking about you know, as Dan was kind of talking about, which I was learning in the moment, that the percentage of male genetic counselors has not really changed too much over the years. Do How are some of the ways that you guys think maybe we could increase that percentage? Because we can kind of get into also what is the advantages of having that percentage higher? Um, so kind of just thinking about what are steps we can take to encourage more males to be entering the field, to support their growth and success once they're part of the profession? Is there anything that, you know, either that you feel like we're doing really well that we should just keep doing more of or something new to be doing? I mean, I think, you know, opportunities for visibility like this are very much a part of it, right? You know, you know, you, I mean, at least for the recruitment standpoint, you have to be able to have uh, role models and be able to kind of see yourself in the profession, in others. Um, and the more we can kind of highlight, you know, the, the uh, male roles and responsibilities in, in, uh, in the field and, and just kind of, I think the different, the multitude of different roles a, a genetic counseling career can take on, um, the, the better we can be at kind of recruiting more males into the field, I think. So I think what you're doing is great, and I, I love this as a, a great step in increasing that representation, which is so important. You got some brownie points there. You're like, what you're doing? <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, I've engaged with the Minority Genetics Professional Network, the MGPN, um, and some of the things that they are doing, trying to engage underrepresented um, and minority um, represented individuals within our profession. Um, it's been a long, hard slog, so to speak, in that the efforts that have been made in the past have not really been as successful as we would like to see them. On the other hand, there are things that we can do as males being models, um, serving as mentors, serving as resources to individuals who are interested or uh, curious about the field. Um, you know, I think those are ways that we can continue to change those numbers in a way that more accurately reflects the populations that we are serving. Yeah, and I think that's a good statement even to apply outside of gender of just everything. I think that's something that, you know, with JEDI initiatives that NSGC and other genetic groups like MGPN that you mentioned, we'll have links to all of these groups in the show notes and also at dnatoday.com, that so many of these groups are, are making these efforts so that our field can be representative of the general population. And like that is the goal. And there's a lot of progress that needs to be made, but it is happening, um, which I do want to recognize. And, and I think one of the reasons, there are many, and we've highlighted some so far on the show, one thing that I think of, of being a benefit to having a higher percentage of males in our profession is looking at salary. So I think that's one aspect that, you know, and I've, right away, you both are nodding. Like, I think just in terms of my own experience of knowing, um, you know, colleagues and other people that I graduated with and, and looking at the professional status survey from the National Society of Genetic Counselors over the years, that we do see that male genetic counselors do have a, a higher average salary than female genetic counselors. So I would think by having more males in the profession, we can 
you know, that will be a way to also increase our salaries. But I don't know. What are, what are your thoughts on that? John, do you have any reactions of, I don't think that's going to happen or, you know? Yeah, I mean, I, I think it, it kind of bears looking into some of that data as far as why those salaries might be higher to see if that could truly be a driver, you know, a hunch that perhaps there are more male identifying genetic counselors going into kind of more industry type of roles, which yep. historically might have been a little bit more higher paying. Um, but I think it could kind of on that point sort of more ties back to, you know, what I'd suggested earlier is about a need to kind of just market our profession a little bit differently and highlight some of those roles that I think don't, don't get enough um, uh, enough airtime and enough kind of representation um, in materials coming out from be it NSGC or other organizations. Um, and if we could do that to just show that there are a lot of opportunities in this field that, you know, would appeal that maybe are more kind of traditional type of male roles or roles that, that males might be like pursue in other avenues outside of the field of, of genetic counseling. So it kind of a, a roundabout answer, but um, I think it kind of all comes back to just again, highlighting just what a multifaceted profession it is. I agree with that. I think especially with where the field started, there really was just like that counseling aspect of in clinic with patients talking through results or talking through, you know, different concepts that is related to genetics. But now we're at this point where, you know, we say we, we've we've called those types of positions, those clinic positions like, you know, traditional or, you know, kind of using that language, which maybe we want to move away from i've heard from other people in the field of like can we start just calling that clinic or patient facing and really call it what it is so that we can be more encompassing of our field really rapidly changing and john you brought up earlier that industry roles have really increased over the years um and so looking at those just in general we've seen the numbers that those pay higher than those clinic roles so it, it makes sense to me that we've got to look at all the factors there you know of just looking at just male versus female salary we do have to say well what types of positions are people taking and and i do like the idea of really representing a lot of different facets of genetic counseling so that people understand it's it's not necessarily just patient facing i think if people have heard of genetic counseling they at least know that aspect but they may not know all the other things we can do, even what you guys have done in your careers outside of seeing patients, you have lots of other beautiful roles. Um, Dan, other other thoughts on salary? Yeah, um, I I think having more males in the profession has already made some difference, but I think it was in either Perspectives or the Journal of Genetic Counseling, maybe it was Perspectives, that there was an attempt to look at that pay disparity that actually demonstrated even when you correct for the roles of males versus females in certain career paths, there was still a disparity. Um, it may not be as much as it is in some other fields, but it still exists. And um, you know, it would be easy to say there are reasons to explain it other than bias, other than societal issues that are part of the problem. Um, just to put it in perspective, when I graduated in the late 80s, my salary was $26,000. Um, and I had wow. over $40,000 <laughs> in debt. So it took a long time to pay that off. Um, but looking at where we are now, where the median salary um, for not new graduates, new graduates are around 80,000 plus or minus. For individuals, it's almost triple, It's it, depending on what state you live in, like California, it is six digits. Um, but it's close to that in most states now, if not at the you know, $100,000 mark, um, which yeah. is nice to see that. Now, there's been inflation over the last 35 years that I've been in this profession. There have been other variables that um, have accounted for those changes. But um, you know, when you just look at the last five years and the salary with our graduates, for example, looking at how those have increased beyond what inflation or many other careers are, we're now running into what's called salary compression. You've got individuals that are coming out at higher salary than someone that's been working for five years. And that creates pressure to move things up. So you have employers and institutions looking at current pay and every couple of years looking to see if there is salary compression, what can they do to counteract that to retain individuals? Otherwise they're at risk for losing them. And there's been a lot more transferability and or flexibility where people are more likely to go out and about. And you mentioned the idea of the four letter word now is traditional genetic counseling. There isn't 
uh, that label a few years ago. I remember many years back and um, when going into industry was going to the dark side. That is no longer the perception to the degree that it was before, but there's still some of that um, and some within our own profession that may question whether or not that's adhering to the genetic counselor essence that you were when you graduated, but we often talk to our students about transferable skills. Communication skills and other things we learn make us reasonably good, if not great, at doing MSL and other types of things, whether industry, going into research, going into other non-genetic counseling related, but using the skills that you learned in your training and as a professional. Yeah. Definitely. I mean, you said so many good points there. I'm like, where do I even go with this? But that, I mean, especially the industry part, I even remember starting grad school and being like, well, like don't want to do industry right away. And, and I didn't end up doing that, but I, yeah, I would say six, seven years ago, even it was like, oh, you're doing industry before you're, you, you, you need to put your, your grunt work in of doing clinic and then you get to be in industry and you could reflect back on your career and all these cases. And yeah. so I, I felt like that was, the theme that I heard from genetic counselors that had been in the field longer than me, especially when I talk about, you know, it's like, oh, I want to be a genetic counselor, just hear from them and their insights. And and I think nowadays, like when I hear someone going right into industry, like I don't have that, you know, reaction of like, oh, you're skipping clinic. Like, you know, I, I think it's, it's really changed. And I, I think that that itself has also helped our salaries increase because industry, you make more than in clinic on average. Yeah. Um, but it, it is surprising. I mean, the 2013 professional status survey, the average um, salary for prenatal, I know, is 100K. So, I mean, that is the first time that I saw it reach six digits. Um, so I think, or six figures, we say, six digits. I was yeah. like, that didn't sound yeah. right. Um, <laughs> so, you know, it, it really, the field is rapidly growing. I mean, inflation has been crazy the past, you know, what do we say, a year and a half, two years but our salaries have, you know, surpassed that. It's not, it's not just that. Um, but yeah, it's, it's, it's very interesting because I don't think we talk about genetic counseling salaries a lot on the show. I, I don't really remember the last time we did. So, um, but very interesting. But, you know, as we kind of close out our discussion, any final thoughts, any advice maybe for males that are considering going into the field or current grad students or maybe recently joined the field of just, maybe different things that you guys have experienced over the years or, you know, any kind of parting thoughts on that end, John, I don't know if you want to start us out. Yeah, I think, um, just important to, to, as a male genetic counselor, to give back when you can in whatever capacity that may look like, uh, you know, again, like Dan was suggesting, if it means, um, something like one-on-one -on -one mentorship, or if it means kind of just increasing your visibility through different kind of volunteer initiatives or even activities like this. Um, I think just the more that other males can see themselves in this profession, the more it'll start to kind of expand and grow and, and diversify the way we're hoping it will. Yeah, yeah, definitely. No, I appreciate you guys coming on and just sharing your, your insight for all the people that will listen to this. Dan, final thoughts. You know, I'm actually going to quote one of our past presidents, Mary Freivogel, a few years back during her presidential address said, do something that scares you. And at that time, that was when I was making a transition to being a program director from being a clinical genetic counselor for decades. Um, and I, I really think that all of us, male, female or other, um, can benefit from stretching our boundaries a little bit and also I found it very important early in my career, the mentorship that I received and the feeling that I wanted to give back to the profession that I so much loved and enjoyed and continue to enjoy. Um, those are things where some of the intangibles, I guess, the other benefits of doing what we do. Um, you know, we, I actually did the Sarah Lawrence newsletter years ago um, for alumni and I made a comment about um, first responders, genetic counselors are first responders. And they use that in the title of the, the article. Um, and I really think it is sim similar to that when you deal with the types of patients we encounter who are in crisis mode and in panic mode and others may be running away or not knowing what to say, genetic counselors really can make a difference. Um, and I think whether, um, your gender identity or your skills or the combination thereof allow you to make a difference in the lives of your patients, obviously, if you're patient facing, 
but you can also make a difference in many other capacities as well with advocacy groups and volunteering and other skills and other things that align well with what many of us are in a caring profession. We all are in a caring profession. Um, and uh, to me, that, that is whether you're male or female, if you want to make a difference, this is a profession where you can. Yeah, you definitely can. I mean, you think about how many lives you touch with just one thing that you do in the field and, you know, whether that's just with one person, but it affects their whole family and then they might tell someone else about, I learned this. And so it, it really is, um, you know, I have to say now that I've actually been, you know, graduated three years ago and actually in the field for, for years, like, you know, it, it was one of the best decisions of my life. It's becoming a genetic counselor. I, I think it's just such a re rewarding field and it, you know, with genetics changing so fast, it's something that I think is always going to keep my attention. Um, but thank you both so much for coming on and just sharing your own personal experiences, your reflection on the profession. Really appreciate hearing from both of you and just appreciate the conversation and your time today. Thank you for using the technology to reach out to the communities um, and the generations of individuals who might otherwise not hear or know about what genetic counselors do. Yeah, thank you so much. Yeah, I appreciate the opportunity, Kira. Thank you. Thanks for watching DNA Today. To access all of our episodes, head over to dnatoday.com. We also have a lot of bonus content on there that you can enjoy. If you have any questions, comments, suggestions, guest pitches, you name it, send them in to info at dnatoday.com. We'd also really appreciate if you could take a moment to rate and review the podcast on Apple, Spotify, wherever you listen to the show. It really helps more nerds like yourself find the show. Also, if you like giveaways and other ways to connect with us, I recommend following us on social. We're at DNA Today Podcast. We also have a Patreon if you want to be the most level involved in the show. That's also at DNA Today Podcast. Thank you so much for listening and watching. Join us next time to learn, discover new advances in the world of genetics.